from Mountain View, California, this is CSD Channel 4D Action News. Presenting the monthly information video. I'm Alan Cruitt, the SSE Training Program Manager for the Education Design and Technology Group. And I'm Richard Houston, Course Developer for Education Design and Technology Group. The purpose of the TFP training video is to prepare qualified support persons to successfully perform the Power Challenge or Power Onyx upgrade. This video has been prepared for those who are certified by Silicon Graphics to maintain the Challenge Onyx product line. This upgrade should not be performed on a system which is unstable or has not been retrofit verified. Performing this upgrade can result in non-functional applications, options, or drivers. We advise you to consult with your customer, area TFP expert, sales reps, and SEs prior to proceeding with this upgrade. This training video will introduce you to topics covered in greater detail in the accompanying reference documents and white papers you have received. We will cover the following topics. A description of the terms and components associated with the upgrade process. How to assess the system to be sure it is ready to be upgraded successfully. How to actually perform the upgrade step by step and how to return to the previous configuration if something goes wrong. The diagnostics, which will assist you in verifying the upgrade. What to do with the leftover parts. And finally, how to obtain official certification to perform the upgrade. OK, so let's begin with a review of some of the new language you've been hearing. Twin Peaks, TFP, IP21, Blackbird, Redwood, and Ragnarok. What do these names mean? The names are code names for SGI's new CPU board and its 64-bit operating system. This video presents an overall look at SGI's new CPU and OS with instructions for installation and testing the upgrade. For more detailed information, you can refer to the listed documents, which are part of your installation kit. Your reference documents are the IP21 board upgrade installation instructions, the Challenge Onyx diagnostic roadmap, the OS release notes, and various white papers included with your kit, which are Introduction to the MIPS Pro compilers, What is IP21, Field Hardware Product Calendar, and copies of the slides of this video. Let's define the various code names for this product. Twin Peaks and Blackbird identify the new IP21 board. TFP identifies the MIPS R8000 chipset. Redwood identifies the new IRIX 6.0 operating system. And Ragnarok identifies the new 64 bits MIPS Pro compiler. What does the IP21 give to the user? True floating point capability. In fact, the highest floating point performance of any available microprocessor. It gives them a new CPU that is compatible with all other eBus boards, except the IP19, which it replaces. IP19 and IP21 boards cannot be mixed. Let's look at the IP21 component layout. The DNA chips are the same DNA chips found on an IP19, and they interface the IP21 to the eBus. The DB chips are new. They buffer data during memory reads and writes, matching the R8000 speed to the eBus speed. Gcache, or global cache, are our memory sims. The IU chip is the R8000 instruction unit. The FPU chip is the R8010 floating point unit. The CC has been redesigned due to different data path into the data cache and the type of data that the GCache holds. CC means cache controller, whereas it used to mean cache coherency. 
The tag RAMs contain the cache line management bits, and the EP ROM contains the microcode for the power on tests. Alan, now that we've looked at the A6, why don't we bring that hot new board in? And when you do that, let's not forget the ESD handling. Okay, Rich, I uh, have an anti-static mat right here, so I'll go get the board and we can set it down. Oh, yeah. Okay, here it is, and I'll tell you what, this is hot. Two points I want to make about the board. The GCAS SIMs are our data cache. They used to be called SCAS SIMs. They are soldered in, and they are not field replaceable units. The other note about the board, there is an EA ROM, but it is used by IRIX and not accessed during the power on process like it is for the IP19 boards. Let's compare the IP19 to this new hot IP21 board. Comparing challenge to power challenge, the number of CPUs in a challenge maximum for a rack were 36 as opposed to 18 for the power challenge. Death side had maximum 12 CPUs, six in power challenge. Our second level data cache was one megabytes. The GCache is now four megabytes. The memory size for the rack and the desk side was maximum two gigabytes and is now 16 gigabytes for our power challenge rack and four gigabytes for the desk side systems. The number of instructions executed per clock used to be one and now is four. The memory reference jumped from 75 to 300. The d internal data path to memory is 64 bits at 50 megahertz as opposed to 128 bits at 75 megahertz. The kernel operation modes can operate in either 32 or 64 bits in challenge, and in a power challenge they will only be 64 bits, and the user operation modes will be either 32 or 64 bits. The new operating system, IREC 6.0, has three enhancements over 5.2. The three enhancements are 64-bit user contexts, new compilers, X11R6 enhancements. On changed are the 32-bit user contents, the basic program set, the file system, and our desktop user interface. New features, a 64-bit user context which allows access to MIPS 3 and MIPS 4 instructions. It's the MIPS 4 instructions that are the floating point go fast mode. Possible issues. Device drivers must be recompiled and ported to 64 bits. A non-issue item, existing 32-bit user applications will run without change. Compatibility issues. IRIX 5X binaries and DSOs will execute under IRIX 6.0. The 64-bit code generated under IRIX 6.0 does not run on current 5X systems. The default is 64-bit operation under IRIX 6.0. All of the compiler-related tools are able to work with either 32-bit or 64-bit binaries. You cannot mix objects and DSOs produced by the 32-bit compiler with objects and DSOs produced by the 64-bit compiler. 6.0 will run on an R4400 system. Let's look at some of the components of 6.0. A 32-bit native development environment, which is the same as IRIX-5 compiler system, and it offers the customer Fortran 77, C, C++, Power Fortran, Power C, Assembler, and Pascal. The new 64-bit native development environment is completely new and offers a different compiler system. It offers a customer Fortran 77, C, C++, Power Fortran, Power C, a beta version of Fortran 90, Assembler, Pascal is not available. 
and most important is a 64-bit cross-development environment. This is a separate product option for IRIX 5X development environments. will allow the user to develop code for power challenge systems on smaller SGI platforms. As Alan mentioned earlier, your customer must be aware that upgrading to the IP21 will render some already installed options unusable until the second release. The two releases are set. The first release it will be quarter one, fiscal 1995. The second release has not been set and you should consult your local salesperson or SE. Let's take a look at the summary. Options supported by the second release but not by the first are listed on this diagram. For PowerOnyx, Video Framer, Video Creator, and CDSIO are not supported in the first release. For Power Challenge Dexide, the third IO, the CDSIO option, and Video Framer are not supported. The PowerOnyx Rack, Video Framer, Video Creator, CDSIO, the third and fourth IO four boards, and the VME and graphics expansion, the third card cage, is not supported by first release. And the power challenge rack, the third and fourth IL4 boards, CDSIO, video framer, and the VME and graphics, graphics expansion option, third card cage, again, are not supported in first release. Remember the upgrade process only works on stable R4400 based systems which have been retrofitted. Any open problems should be corrected prior to introducing the potentially new variables of an IP21 and 6.0 operating system. Your system should have 5.1.1.x or 5.2 software on it. And remember to have your customer perform a full backup prior to your upgrade event. If you're not sure that your system is ready to be upgraded, please check with your local TFP expert. Again, the single most important point of assessing a system for upgrade is that there should be no unresolved problems on the system you're upgrading. We're ready to consider the steps of the upgrade itself now. Remember, if you start from a stable system, one that has received the field retrofit, the installation process should, pre should proceed smoothly if the following steps are performed correctly. Step one. Obtain an ASCII terminal or equivalent. This is required if problems occur during the upgrade of an Onyx system. The installation can be performed from the graphics console assuming no problems arise. Step two, verify that no known problems exist with the current operating system, IRIX 511X or 5.2. That means no open hardware calls, no open software calls, no intermittent problems occurring. The upgrade can be performed if the customer is running IRIX 511X or 5.2. And before you start, verify that the customer has a complete backup. Step three, boot IRIX. Log in as root. Turn on recording at your laptop or open a script file. This will save the process and any error messages which could be used to help determine why you encountered a failure. Steps four and five are optional steps. They are performed in the event an installation leaves the IL-4 in an unusable condition. Step four, determine the current version of the IL-4 flash code by executing the following command flash IO minus V. This will return a slot number that the IO4 was in and will show you the current version of the code in currently installed. The example would be you ha currently have 1.17 flash code installed on that system. Step number five, create a copy of the current IO4 flash code by executing the following command. Copy user CPU firmware IO4 prom.bin to user CPU firmware IO4 prom.bin.save. If the installation fails, you can use this to reflash your IO4. Step 
Step six, install the CD-ROM into the CD-ROM reader. Step seven, mount the CD-ROM using the following command. Mount minus R slash dev slash dis slash dks0 dns7 slash CD-ROM, where N is the address of your CD-ROM reader. Step eight, flash to IO4PROM in the GE10, if this is an Onyx system, using the following command. inst minus F slash CD-ROM slash disk slash IO4PROM. When the install tool is entered, execute the following inst commands. list, go, followed by quit. And an important note to make here, if you have a multiple IO4 or GE10 system, they are flashed at the same time. Once the IL-4 is flashed, if you have to reinstall the IP-19 for any reason, you do not have to reflash the IL-4 to its original version. The new version is compatible with an IP-19 or an IP-21. Step nine will prove that the flash completed successfully. Step nine, verify the new version of the IL-4 prom code by executing the following command flash IO minus V. It should return the following. Flash prom version is 302. Step 10, if you are satisfied, shut down IRIX. And step 11, swap out the IP19 boards with the new IP21s. Don't forget to use wrist straps in your ESD bags. The last step will boot the mini root installation tool. You will load all the default images from the 6.0 CD-ROM plus any additional images that the customer wants installed. Step 12. With the 6.0 CD-ROM installed, boot the MR inst from the PROM monitor. Load all default images plus any the customer wants. If the system was an R4400 with 6.0 beta software running, Execute the following ins command before starting the load. Set newer override on. And after your load, remind your customer to back up the new system. In the event something goes wrong, leaving the IO4 unusable, or the new IP21 is bad, you will have to return the systems to its initial state. The following should help recover your system. Backing off the upgrade for a challenge system. If the new IP21 is bad, just reinstall the IP19. The new IL4 flash code functions with an R4400 or an R8000 CPU. Once the IL4 is flashed with the new code, the GE10 must be flashed back to its original version before it is again compatible with the IP19. If you have to reinstall the IP19, an exception error will occur during the power on cycle when the PROM monitor attempts to initialize the graphics system. Later in this video, while viewing the standard output created during power on, I will indicate the point where the exception is taken. Swap the IP21 with the original IP19. Set bit 15 of the debug register, this is a new bit. This inhibits the PROM monitor from seeing the GE10, which contains code incompatible with the IP19. Boot IRIX, manually reflash the GE10, shut down IRIX, set bit 15 of the debug register, and boot IRIX. You should be back to where you were. The news is good concerning IP21 diagnostic coverage. It's basically the same as it was for IP19. Three levels of testing are available. The IP21 diagnostic coverage is made up of your PROM-based diagnostics, which are your power on and pod, the standalone test, the IDE, and your IRIX level diagnostics that live at user diag. The PROM diagnostics, which are contained in the EP-ROM of each CPU, are more thorough and comprehensive than the IP19 tests. The PROM diagnostics are made up of the power on diagnostics, comprised of the cache tests, the CC tests, the A-chip tests, the FPU test, the CC join tests, and the niblet function tests, which must be invoked through pod. The Nibla tests are small MP kernels. They test the basic MP functionality. 
the test numbers are 0 through 19, with 16, 17, 18, and 19 as new tests. And don't forget that test 0 through 9 can be run from your ASCII terminal on port TTYD1, and tests 11 through 19 require the ASCII terminal to be attached to the system controller UART, which is your backplane connection. The power on sequence looks the same with a few exceptions. The following three slides illustrate the power on sequence with two points of interest highlighted. Note that the S1 chips are no, the tests for the S1 chips no longer appear where they used to be. And on the third slide, note that, note the point where the exception would occur if the GE10 microcode does not match the IO4. The IDE uses the same interface as the IP19 IDE, but only the MC3, the IO4, and the FPU are tested. Diagnostic engineering took this approach because they felt if the power on test passed and the IDE can be booted, the IP21 is functional and further testing is not required at this level. The IDE is made up of the MC3 tests, the IO4 tests, the IP21 FPU tests, and again, there are no IP21 CPU tests in the IDE. For the most part, the IRIX level diagnostics are the same. The IRIX level diagnostics must be installed on your system. You log in as Diag, which gives you root permissions. The user can be running processes in the background, but there could be a significant performance loss. The memory tests have been modified so that they have shorter run times, and an average system takes approximately two hours to complete. The time increases as CPUs are added. And one last note, running these tests, if a panic is detected, you could bring the system down. We have server tests and graphics tests. The server tests are made up of memory, disk I.O., a new test called the fine test, an optional network test, and a floating point unit test. The graphics tests are made up of all the tests in the server group, your screen compares, and the graphics IDE. These tests should be run for system acceptance after the install. The last point I want to stress concerning diagnostics is your approach to troubleshooting an IP21 system, and that is use the same approach used to troubleshoot the IP19. Once you are satisfied that the upgrade is complete and the system is healthy, it is time to do your paperwork and return the old IP19 boards. Let's bring Alan back to talk about the RMA process and close this video. Good luck with your upgrades. You should all be acquainted with the RMA process. Your upgrade kit contains everything you need in order to return your IP19s. Please remember that we need your IP19s. They are critical to manufacturing's ability to meet build schedules and provide you with the refurbished spares you may need in the future. Now that you have viewed the video, you're ready to obtain your IP21 training certificate. There are several reasons we want to certify support persons. First, we would like to do our part to promote communications among registered IP21 support folks. So by obtaining certification, you will be registered and added to a distribution list with others who support TFP. Our second concern is gathering feedback on the effectiveness of this video. So we'll ask you to answer six questions to demonstrate your understanding of the product and the upgrade process and help us make better training videos for you in the future. In return for taking the time to answer these questions, you will receive a certificate of completion and an SGI souvenir. To answer the certification questions, I suggest that you make a copy of the questions and review the video. Question number one. When assessing a system for the IP21 upgrade, what is the single most important consideration about the state of the system? Number two, when are the proms being flashed? Number three, 
if you have to back off the upgrade on a challenge system, what do you have to do to the IO4 prompt? Number four, if you find yourself having to back off the upgrade on an Onyx, what has to be done to the IO4 prom and the GE10 prom? Number five, what's the best diagnostic for establishing the functionality of the IP21? And our last question is, did this video prepare you adequately to perform the upgrade? To receive your certificate and the souvenir, please send the answer to all six questions via email only to Alan at CSD with the subject line TFP Feedback. And don't forget to include your return address, which should be your mail stop. Thank you and good luck with the upgrades. Wow, Dave, these are pretty cool credits. That must have taken a lot of work. In fact, judging by your eyes, it looks like you've been up all night. It does take a lot. Where do you see these outtakes? <clears throat> Get that Dudley do right out of my throat. <coughs> the tape is rolling. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so we're on outtakes now yes. for the closing credits. Uh, Hi, I'm Alan Cruitt, the SS Richard Person. Hi, Rick. And I'm Nick Houston. <laughs> <laughs> One day crew, huh? Okay. I had it the first time. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Richard's audio as well. Okay. okay. Hi, I'm Alan Cruitt in the Education Design and Technology Group, and I'm the SSC Training Program Manager. And I'm Richard Houston, Development. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Alan Cruitt, the SSC Training Program Manager in the Education Design and Technology Group. And I'm Richard Houston. Development instructor in the education design and development group. <laughs> <laughs> that was so close. <laughs> Action in five. Wait, four. wait. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Alan Cruitt, the SSE training program manager in the education. <laughs> 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 we're gonna be, we're gonna be here next Friday. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. 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 <laughs> now that that's up there, I'm confused. <laughs> I was, I'm looking at the. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Action in five, four, three. Hi, I'm Alan Cruitt, the SSE. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> more script, and then I was ready to do this. I'm going to be a basket case. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's just fun. We have six hours. Oh, man. <clears throat> okay. Okay, keep going. Action. Four, three, two, one. <laughs> Come on, you're supposed to be the model here. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, man. <sighs> Four, three. Hi, I'm Alan Cruitt, the Ed, the S. <laughs> oh, God. It's not oh. going to work. <laughs> yes, it was laughing. <clears throat> oh, man, I did that beautiful. And I got back Ragnarok. It's one of the toughest words I've got to say. Twin Peaks and Blackboard. Ragnarok identifies the new 64-bit MIPS compiler. Action. IP19 and IP21 boards cannot be mixed. Let's look at the IP21 component layout. Ooh, I don't like that. <laughs> the IU chip is the R4000. Where did that go? Where did that cut? Where did the R4000? And the kernel mode. Uh, cur I didn't move. Oh, I, well, maybe I'm on my. I may. <laughs> set bit fifth. Set bit fifteen of the debug register. Set bit fifth. Set bit fifteen of the debug register. 
Set bit, fifth, set bit 15 of the debug register. <laughs> and the niblet tests are also available in pod, but must be invoked through pod. Cut. <laughs> the controller tests. Cut. Thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, and, in, and please, you know, enjoy doing the upgrade. And I blew that part because I'm supposed to read this whole other paragraph. Thank you. <laughs>